So the thing that most surprised me when I looked up this story afterwards was that Bob the Cat was in part played by the real Bob the Cat. Yeah, indeed. And I read that he wasn't supposed to be in the movie originally. No. So originally, we, they'd been training four stunt cats in Vancouver, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and they were amazing. And these incredible animal handlers bought these beautiful cats over, which were very good for like jumping on a bus or jumping onto my shoulders, but weren't very good at being in a crowded place. So uh, after about a week, we realized that Bob was the only one that could handle busking in Covent Garden. So <laughs> suddenly, what, what James and Bob had imagined would be a couple of set visits and you know just enjoying the whole process was suddenly 6 a.m. pickups to be there every day for 12 hours. And uh, before each take, James would come over to me and Bob would walk from his shoulders onto mine. We'd, we'd busk and you know, do the scene, and then he would go onto James's shoulder. Totally surreal, bizarre. <laughs> But amazing. Um, so did Bob take a while to warm up to you? Or was he like, okay, if, if James says you're safe, I can sit on your shoulders? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. He came around to my house beforehand. I had James and Bob over. And um, uh, he was, he was, he's pretty cool with people generally. I mean, he's not your average cat. He spent the last four years doing book signings and meeting fans. So... Uh, he's quite warm to people and new people. Um, he was lovely. He's a lovely guy. And I also read that Bob would get recognized in the middle of a scene. In Covent Garden, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'd be filming in Covent Garden, and, and obviously that's like their sort of home turf. And, um, you know, there would be people who would come up and start shouting, James and Bob, during the, the film, which was kind of lovely but at the same time in the story they weren't meant to be a massive phenomenon by then so it's kind of weird but yeah they got recognized a lot so you have worked with animals before but live on stage i don't know if you guys know this but luke was the origin in the original um curious incident of the dog at night time in london um yeah <laughs> But what's the difference between working on stage with animals and, you know, the rats are in the cage, the puppy is in one scene, and yeah. sharing every scene with an animal and doing it not live as well? Yeah, well, yeah in Curious, we'd have, we'd have a rat that would come on in a cage, which was fine because it was in a cage. Um, and then we'd have the dog that would come out at the end and people would make that noise, the like, ah, ah noise, and sometimes it would like wee on the stage and that would be quite funny. Um, and that was always quite, it was kind of handleable. Um, and then doing every scene in the film with a cat on your shoulder, like, that's different, <laughs> so different. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a weird sort of recurrent theme in the jobs I do. Yeah. So do you ever feel self-conscious when you're talking to an animal and there are all these people with cameras, you know, far away? Do I feel self-conscious? Yeah. About? How do you mean? Well, is it, do you have this, because you're not getting from Bob what you would get. Well, I know, yeah, he's a bit, <laughs> yeah. He's a bit, yeah. I mean, he's, he is a good scene partner, he is. Um, and, you know, when he came out of his trailer, he would he'd deliver. But sometimes he'd have to wait, and there were times when you, he would need to go to the toilet and we'd have to find him a little patch of grass. And, um, you know, but he was patient with us. We were patient with him. And, um, yeah, it was different, though. It was different. I also heard that the first time that James came to set was when you were doing the scene right after you have the heroin overdose pretty early on in the film, which sounds quite intimidating to have someone who you're playing at the darkest period in their life, you know, come at that moment. Yeah, I suppose it sort of added a certain something. Um, I suppose because he'd already shared his story, in a way, he'd, because he'd shared his story in the book, and then also with me personally meeting up... This is fine. Um, he'd, he'd sort of, I don't know, it wasn't like... It wasn't like I felt like I was for the first time talking to him about this or, or he was, he'd shared it before. Um, and it was, 
you know, I don't know, it was, it was really good to have him there, I think, for everyone, not just me, but the, the whole crew and the director and everyone, I think it was really helpful that he was there. Yeah. So to prepare for the role, you slept outside and you bust a bit. I did. Um, I did. I asked James if he'd take me on a little recon mission around Soho and we, we uh, went out one evening busking and he showed me, you know, he'd be like, that's the doorway I woke up in on Christmas morning 2011 and that's, you know, and he would say to me how he would go up to a table of people outside a bar and, and what he would say and for about five hours I would just follow his lead. So James was like this incredible kind of uh, director really for me at that time and, and took me out on this kind of evening of like um, sort of research really and uh, and we we went round and we went up to lots of tables and you know we sometimes people would say I haven't got any money and you'd look at the table and you'd go wow I haven't got any money but you've got two bottles of rosé and an iPhone it was amazing um, and sometimes you'd, you'd get a bit of money and so you know throughout the evening you would get a little tiny taster of what it was like uh, you know obviously I'd never understand what it's really like but it just dipped my toe in and uh, and then at the end of the night James found me a kind of warm air vent on a street which he knew would be safe and uh, and I slept there yeah yeah What's the sort of most that you've invested yourself in research for a role? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking maybe uh, sometimes parts that have required like a long term period of weight loss or something like that is quite a sort of intense thing to do. Are you talking about Unbreakable? Well, that Unbroken, I, yeah, that okay. and, and a couple of others as well that I've done that have also done that. Um, but no, I think that's my favourite part though of it. It really is. Like, um, I think if I wasn't an actor, I'd be like a detective or a historian or something that was, I don't know, I, I really enjoy the kind of devouring the internet and, and books and, and meeting and talking to people um, about the world it's like living many lifetimes in one really and so for this we went to a couple of different drug rehabilitation centers and spoke to loads of patients and doctors and I don't know you just suddenly you'll find yourself learning about a life that you are not living in. it's an amazing privilege really to be able to go and talk to people from different walks of life that's what I love about it and do you find it easy to draw the line between your life and the life that you're taking on yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I also didn't know that Charlie Fink from Noah and the Whale wrote the songs that you perform in this movie. Yeah. Charlie's brilliant. Yeah. No, he he wrote I think six or seven of them. There's a couple of other writers as well, but yeah, he wrote a lot. He was great. You like you like Noah and the Whale? Yeah. Yeah. They're great. Um, and James has quite a specific accent cuz he's Australian, but he's been in he was born in England. He's been in England for a while, so it's kind of anglicized yeah how did you get that hung out with james um i mean i always knew that from the moment i met him i knew that i was gonna some people were gonna be thinking i did a really bad australian accent but i just thought well i don't know i just try and sound like him and that's what it is he does he sounds at times very london and at times quite australian and it sort of is up and down all the time um but yeah so just hung out with him a lot so you first, I read that your first role ever in life as an actor was... Um, a daffodil in a pantomime. Yes, <laughs> which is just a great story. You're never going to live that. My down. dad was the big bad wolf. I come from a tiny little village in Devon in the southwest of England, the countryside. And uh, we had a little village hall. And uh, I don't know, they were doing... What is it? What was the big bad wolf in Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah. Anyway, I was a daffodil and I had flour around my head. I got chased off the stage by my dad. <laughs> I was three years old. And that was it for you? Yeah, that was it. That was my big break. <laughs> um, but I know that you and your brother had a very formative drama school teacher, right, when you That's were right. growing up. Yeah, a couple of, yeah, yeah. At what point did you decide, I, get, I don't know if you guys know this, but Luke has a twin who's also an actor. Um, at what point did you decide, okay, I want to go to drama school? And did you make that decision separately or talk to each other about it? Uh, it was our own decisions, definitely. Like, we weren't, we, yeah, it was my own decision. Um, 
after doing National Youth Theatre, which is like a really good programme for uh, young kids in England to go and do a sort of summer course, and then you can do productions um, in the summer holidays. But I was there and I, I heard about this thing called drama school. And I was 16 at the time. And it's really weird, I think, that at 16 or 17, you have to tick forms on a box to go to college and decide what you're going to do with your life. You're like 16. It's weird. Um, but I thought that uh, three years of, of doing what I'd done at the National Youth Theatre, which was basically, you know, all sorts of... It's like a sort of mini drama school in three, three weeks. But uh, I thought that would be fun for three years. So I ticked that box. And are you glad that you did? Yes. Um, so you went to Lambda, right? Mm -hmm. Did you sort of think that you would do theater when you graduated? Did you want to go into film and television? Did you even think that far ahead? I probably wasn't thinking that far ahead, really. Um, I was really lucky when we were, me and Harry both got a, um, a job when we were in our first year to do between the first and the second year in the summer holidays. Um, an amazing, like, still now one of my favourite ever experiences of working. We played conjoined twins in a punk band in the early 70s. <laughs> amazing. Um, and uh, so we, we were literally harnessed together with, with, like, climbing harnesses for a whole summer. And, uh, yeah, I mean, totally weird. Brothers of the Head, it's called. Check it out. And um, uh, so we got to do that, and that, that came out as we were leaving drama school. And so that kind of was a, like a nice little thing to be to have coming out. But I, I don't know, yeah, it just sort of happened, really. You don't really think far ahead when you're young, do you? And was your drama school fine with you making this movie during the holidays? No, it was, it was a bit awkward. Yeah, because they, they were a bit... They, they hate it, really. Yeah. yeah. They don't really like that. I think it's the same here that they don't really yeah. let you do anything. But um, we had a really good drama. There was a really good acting teacher there who, you know, he told them that there was a really good idea that we should probably take this film. Um, and th we were meant to like miss a week off the first of the second year, but then we ended up missing a term because it overran and all that stuff. But um, yeah, we came back and, and got straight into it. It was cool. They marked us down at the end, though. I think, yeah, we missed a term, so. And what about your classmates? Were they like, oh, these guys think they're so big? Not to my face. No, I don't think so. I don't know. I wasn't. I don't think so. Um, I don't know. It was, a f it was an amazing experience to go and do. Um, I don't know what they thought. Have you, you also did a play with your brother, right? Yeah. We don't make a habit of it, I have to say. In 10 years, just one film, one play. But yeah, we did a play at the Royal Court in London, yeah. So you've done a lot of theater. You were also in War Horse, right? That was at the original production as well? Yeah. At the National Theater? Yeah. And you won an Olivier Award for it? Uh, or was that, that for That was for Curious, Curious yeah. Curious yeah. Um, so you've done a lot of theater. Why do you keep coming back to theater? Um, well, I, I love it. I mean, it's it's kind of what, you know, any actor is your first experience of, of, of doing it, isn't it, really? Like, you don't do a film in your living room. You do, you do a play to your, to your kind of friends or whatever. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I love it. I think it's a really, it's an amazing thing. I think at best, I mean, you can go and see a few plays and you go, oh, what's theatre about? But then you go and see one in ten and you go, that is amazing. And for all of the special effects and incredible technical achievements that film can can now do nowadays, you know, there's nothing like putting people in the dark for two hours and just having people live on stage and, and creating the whole world like that. I mean, it's asking more of the audience to sort of suspend their disbelief and go with it. But it's also, if you get it right, and I was lucky enough to be, I think, in two productions that really did get it right, the, the, of those two, um, it's the most magical thing ever, and I think more more magical than any film, really. Um, so I love it, yeah. How do you sustain that magic when you're doing the same play, you know, every week for months on it? Well, I mean, a lot of it's done for you by the whole, by everyone else involved in it, but you just have to keep doing your own, keep keep doing your own thing, I suppose. But it's more than just you; it's the whole whole production especially those two plays they're, they're such big beasts of a production that um that you have so much kind of already being done for you by the design and the lights and the sound and all the other actors and the whole story of it um 
But you just have to keep focused on doing whatever it was you were meant to be doing in the rehearsal room, really. Please. Has every role you've taken felt like a stepping stone towards the next role? Do you feel like you've had sort of a trajectory? Um, I think it's, I, I would always think acting is like that. It's like a roller coaster, isn't it? It's like you sort of, as soon as you think that maybe something's going really well and like, oh my God, I've got two jobs back to back, then guaranteed you won't work for three months. Or, you know, there have been times when, I remember there was a, great, a brilliant moment when I'd, there was a film called Attack the Block that I was in that came out a few years ago and I'd made it a, a, a year before or something and it had been, you know, the, up until the premiere, like the last couple of months have been a bit quiet and for whatever reason, I think it's like one of the only times, but I've, I was like working on a building site that day and I remember I was like sanding floorboards, which is literally a joke because that's what people sometimes refer to like out of work actors. It's like, yeah, you'd be sanding floorboards. And I was sanding floorboards the day of the premiere and I remember running home to my flat with sawdust in my hair like shaking it out, putting on the borrowed suit that I'd borrowed from somewhere and like going to Leicester Square on the red carpet. And I, I still always laugh at those photos because it's like from the outside it would look like, oh yeah, things are going great. But literally that day I was like sanding floorboards. And that's that I think in one day sort of sums up what it is really being a sort of an actor really. You're kind of always, you're just trying to see what else is out there and essentially taking whatever comes next. I mean, you, you see it and you, you hopefully it's good and and... You know, yeah. You said in the past that in terms of when you're unsure about a film, sometimes you'll have your mother read it, and sometimes, <laughs> sorry, and um, some, but ultimately, yeah. um, it has to pass to Tess, which is, would you enjoy seeing it, and would you be comfortable recommending your friends that's see it? That's exactly right. Yeah, would you t tell your friends to go and spend ten pounds watching it? I think that's that has to be the case because if you wouldn't, then why would you do it? Yeah. Have you ever done something where you wouldn't tell your friends to go see it? Yeah, maybe once. I don't know. I mean, you know, you, there is also the fact of having to pay rent and all that stuff. So, you know, there are times when you were like, you know, I don't know. But if, you know, you've got to get something out of it. And maybe I, I, I would always, I will say this now, like there's, I would, I've always got something out of doing it. And um, I don't mean in like, monetary returns i mean like there's a part there that i admit maybe the film i i'm not sure about but i've never played that kind of part before and plus there's nothing else so uh, there have been times when i've gone yeah i'll do that because i've never played that before and there's nothing else <laughs> yeah so you obviously have this film coming out and then i have have any of you seen fortitude um, it's this great TV show on Pivot that was a co-production with um, Sky, Atlantic. Sky Atlantic. And it's set in a little island in the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Um, and it's a murder mystery. Stanley Tucci was in the first season. Michael Gambon was really interesting. And it's coming back for a second season. And you yeah. have survived. You're one of the, there aren't many original cast members left. Yep, yeah, I survived. Survived, yeah. Um, so what do you want to do more of? I don't know. I mean, just it's always about the story, really, about the script, I think. Um, if the writing's good, then you've got a chance. And if it's not, then you really don't. So I, I, whether that's... I mean, I'm doing a play next in, in January in London, um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Um, so that's going to be fun. Another animal in the title. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and <laughs> yeah, but I just yeah, I don't know. Just I'm really lucky to be able to do a bit of each. Really, I'm really fortunate. Um, and we have one question from the audience about working with cats. Someone will be working with cats shortly, and they wanted you to share your suggestions and comments. Suggestions. <laughs> Who is this person? Who? Yeah, go on. What's happening? You doing a film with cats? Uh, I tell you, I tell you one tip. Do you know? Do you have a brand here called Dairy Lee? Like it's like a sort of cream cheese. Dairy Lee Dunkers we had, which basically Bob would do anything for, essentially. Um, and uh, so have them on your. The people literally would have members of the crew, like the Sparks and stuff, would have them in their pockets just literally to keep them quiet. 
So definitely go go down the treat route, yeah. And um, uh, you know, I want you know tell everyone involved in it that they're never going to have um, any sense of quiet make believe in the moment because there's always going to be someone behind the camera going. And like it's you know it's an absolute joke. So essentially, it's like working with the biggest diva you've ever been on set with, and it's all for them. And no, no, when you're ready, Bob. When you're ready. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's that's the way you've got to do it. But Roger, the director, he he did have previous with working with animals, and um, and uh, and he had a few good techniques. But um, yeah, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> is what I say. <laughs> Yeah, good. Lots of treats and um, and laser pen, a laser pen. They look they look for laser pens, so you can use that. Giving it all away now, um, but yeah, I think that's two quite good practical tips. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, I didn't believe that you'd have anything actually. No, like I, I'm surprised at myself for having anything to offer there, but it's true what they say. You can't herd cats and you can't train them really. So um, you know, but yeah. They, they, sometimes they do remarkable things you don't expect, and um, you just need to get, you know, you just need to get some of that and you know, cut it right, and it'll be all right. Bob's high five was my favorite skill of his. Yeah. Well, I when James and Bob first walked into my flat, and <laughs> oh god, James walked in and he just turned around to Bob and went, "Bob, sit," and he sat. <laughs> I was just like, what? That's amazing. Um, okay, right, this is real. Um, yeah, he does, and he does do high fives, and just, James just does like that, and he does a little high five, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming, and thank you. Thanks for coming, guys.